Pre-recorded from Joe's mom's basement, welcome to another Rewind episode of the Stacking Benjamin Show. Hey everyone, I'm Griffin the Intern, but the guys who delivered Doug's industrial strength hair gel just call me the Fintern. I think I might be involved in too many clubs. Anyway, we've come to the end of another Rewind week. You think I should bring up the fact that I haven't been paid yet? Hey, uh, wasn't this supposed to be a paid internship? <laughs> All I've had so far is a steady diet of expired Kit Kats and Joe's mom's fruitcake. Speaking of fruitcakes, Joe and OG are currently recovering from a two-day Halloween candy binge, but miraculously still had the foresight to leave a sticky note instructing me to, quote, upload whatever seems appropriate, end quote. It only took me a minute to realize that the episode, Investing 101 with Ellie K is always appropriate. Not only was she a great guest on the show, but she's also launching her new podcast, The Money Millhouse, so even the timing is appropriate. This episode also features PK from Don't Quit Your Day Job, some headlines, and yes, even Doug's trivia. This episode originally aired November 30th, 2015. As always, remember to disregard any investment advice or giveaways. Enjoy, Finn Turn out. Hey guys, it's Shelby Schreiber from the University of Texas. When I'm not practicing to ride my bike 4,500 miles for cancer research, I'm stacking Benjamins. Live from our sumptuous studios in Seattle, Washington, it's the Stacking Benjamin Show. Dang it, we're still in this hole in the ground in Texarkana. Man, can't blame a girl for trying though, am I right? Anywho, this week we're talking investing and saving. On today's show, America's family finance expert, Ellie K. PK from DQYDJ.net. A listener asks about life insurance and some totally Funyun trivia. And here they are, two guys who put the fun in Funyun, Joe and O-J-J-J-J-G. I feel like it's active contrition week here on the podcast, OG. Like last week, all we talked about was spending money. So now we got to talk about saving, right? We got to make up for it. But I like spending more than saving. It's so much more fun, and I feel so much guiltier afterwards. Hey, everybody. Welcome to another episode of the Stack and Benjamin Show. I am Joe Solsi. Hi, Average Joe Money. On Twitter, across the card table from me is the one and only OG. I certainly am the one. I don't know about the only. I got to tell you, it is cold and rainy here today in basement land, and mom made chili this weekend. You missed the chili, man. I love I, chili. I always weekend. miss all the good stuff. I miss chili. I miss Halloween parties. I suppose you'll probably have a nice Christmas dinner that I won't get invited yeah, to. Yeah, we'll have a bunch of holiday parties that we'll tell you about afterwards about how awesome they were, OG, because that's what nice. we do. Right. Yeah. But I'm you like know, just down the street, and it's like the thing, it's like in Wreck It Ralph when Ralph like goes up and's like, hey, are you guys having a party or something? You're like, mm, no. <laughs> like, pretty loud over there. I can see the dancing ball and everything, the music. Ah, uh, no, no. All these people randomly over. You know someplace you don't go randomly, OG? You don't go randomly to stackingbenjamins.com forward slash magnify money. You go there on purpose because it's a place where the average person saves $450. If you're somebody that has debt, you need to refinance that debt. Head to stackingbenjamins.com forward slash magnify money because you will find the best deals very quickly. You'll also find the best deals on savings accounts, on checking accounts. You know what? Time to turn over a new leaf with the new year coming. And if you have a great, I almost said a great interest rate again. What's up with that? A great credit score. Head to stackingbenjamins.com forward slash SoFi. It's S-O-F-I. You know, at Magnify Money, they rate SoFi number one for people with great credit. So if you're somebody who's looking at a personal loan at a mortgage, say you're going to buy a new house for the new year. That is a present. Wouldn't that be a present to find a new house underneath your Christmas tree? I'm still trying to get one of those Lexuses. You know, it's the season to remember. With the big red bow. Because I love you so much. I'm going to get you a car that you have never experienced before. Yeah. You've never driven it. You've never test driven it. You've never said you wanted it. I just bought you a car. And I'll go heavily into debt for both of us to get it. Nothing says I love you like a car loan. Like, like, hey, sweetie, so I'm going to need to work some overtime. Pay for your $600 a month Lexus payment that I got you. It's a gift that keeps on giving. 
You get a new car and I don't have to be home. <laughs> <laughs> Bam! <laughs> StackyBenjamins.com forward slash SoFi, S-O-F-I, although I'm sure Dan Macklin doesn't want to be affiliated with that commercial. <laughs> but actually, you know, if you have a mortgage, best place to go to refinance that mortgage, StackyBenjamins.com forward slash S-O-F-I. You got to look at that too. I mean, interest rates are ridiculous, ridiculously low. Got to be the time. Speaking of ridiculous, we got ridiculously good guest today in L.E.K. We've got ridiculously good stuff from P.K. We got some ridiculously good headlines to kick it all off, so let's move. Hello, darlings. And now it's time for your favorite part of the show, our stacking Benjamin's headlines. Our first headline comes to us from the Wall Street Journal. This one also comes by way of listener Lenny. Thanks a ton, Lenny, for sending in his idea for a great headline. This was an amazing headline. Scary headline, actually, OG. Thousands hit with surprise tax bill on income in IRAs. Affected are investors holding master limited partnerships in retirement accounts. This is clearly a case of people not knowing how the rules work. So let me read the beginning of this Wall Street Journal piece. On October 13th, two days, two days before the final 2014 tax filing deadline, investor Steve Goldston of Phoenix received a surprise tax bill for, wait for it, OG, $24,321. It was for units of a master limited partnership affiliated with Kinder Morgan, Inc. that Mr. Goldman held in his Roth IRA account. The total included nearly $6,000 of late filing penalties and interest. Mr. Goldston said, I was outraged. A little surprise on his hand. That's not the kind of present you're looking for getting ready for the holidays right now, OG. What a kick in the seat that would be, huh? And when you've got limited partnerships inside of IRAs, the interest, if it goes above a certain number, is all taxable. So if you load up on these high-income devices inside of your IRA, you're going to have a tax bill, whether you want one or not. So you got to watch out for money in master limited partnerships inside of your IRA. Yeah, this guy found out, and other people should know, that... Limited partnerships, master limited partnerships, MLPs are very complicated things. Yeah, they have a whole different set of rules. I used to invest personally and for my clients in a company called Cedar Fair, which is Cedar Point Amusement Park and a whole collection of amusement parks across the United States. But they're organized as a limited partnership. And I had to warn my clients that depending on how much money they were going to get in, in interest from this, you know, partnership interest off of this limited partnership OG, that the IRA tax shelter might not help them. So we had to be really careful about that. Limited partnerships don't play by the same rules. You got to really recognize or at least anticipate a little bit, I suppose, what the income might look like. Good scenario, not so great scenario, and kind of run the different calculations from a planning standpoint. Yeah, if you've got limited partnerships in your IRA, I think that's a great thing right now to ask your advisor about. Maybe link back to our show notes. Go check out our Explain show notes. Explain this, dear advisor. Yeah. Tell me, am I going to get hit with this? Our second headline as our last day in November, last show in November. Great one to finish up with. Get ready for a decade of 6% annual returns in the stock market. This comes to us from Morningstar, Jack Reckenthaler. He says, this month, the Journal of Portfolio Management published Occam's Razor Redo, Establishing Reasonable Expectations for Financial Market Returns. Authored by Jack Bogle of Vanguard Investments and Michael Nolan Jr., the article projects U.S. stocks to gain about 6% over the next decade. Bonds figure to make half as much, 3%. Both of those figures are nominal terms. That is, they're not adjusted for inflation. So getting a six straight percent, not inflation adjusted percent, but 6% in the stock market. The thing I find interesting about this, of course, is just about two years ago, he had a quite different scenario for the next 10 years. A very rosy scenario, as I recall. He says, with the stock market's current yield at 2% and historical nominal earnings growth at 4.7, they arrived at a number slightly less than 7, which they cut to 6 by assuming that today's P.E. ratio will finish the period its historic norm. So they applied some math to this. I think this is more financial porn for me, OG, because when they say that stocks are going to do 6%, What's your alternative? Your alternative maybe is that, okay, maybe I'd use bonds. But like they said, bonds are going to return half that. So bonds don't become the answer. Does real estate become the answer? Real estate's fairly illiquid. So having some money in real estate is always a good idea. But having the balance of your portfolio, if you're going to try to draw income from it in real estate, not sure that that's the panacea. This is all porn. 
This is exactly <laughs> what that is. I can't stand reading this stuff at all. You know, I mean, what the hell does anybody know what's going to happen tomorrow? Well, if you're going to use this, let's say you are going to read this. The question's got to be, what do I do with it, right? And maybe what I do is I go into my financial plan and, okay, assuming that I want to say this is right, what does that mean? That means I'm going to get a lower rate of return on my stocks than I thought, right, OG? So that means one of three things is going to happen. I either have to push the goal back because my returns aren't going to be as high. So then I have to think about longer term goals. Or number two, I have to take more risk in my portfolio to try to beat that number, which the chances go down pretty quickly if you're going to buy the 6% number. But the third thing means I got to save more money. So we just took this thing that's complete porn and we turned it into stuff that you can do yourself if you choose to believe it. If you want to use a lower rate of return for stocks, fine. Just either push the goal back, save more money, or take more risk, right? Are there any other options? Maybe do less, right? Make the goal. Spend less than your goal. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Make the goal smaller. But take this stuff, if you're going to use it, take it and make it something you can use. Yeah, you can't just take the information to your point and just cry about it. I'm going to be scared. Yeah. I mean, if you're going to read this crap, you at least have to do something about it. Exactly what you're saying. Yeah. Um, I don't happen to ever read it because I think it's garbage immaterial, especially when they change their opinion, depending on which way the wind blows, which he has. Uh, like I said, I think two years ago, he said that the annual return for the next decade of stocks was going to be close to 9%. And now he's saying six. I mean, because the market went down the last couple of days. Give me a break. Yeah. Those are our headlines. Head to stackconventions.com for our show notes page where you'll find links to both of those articles if you want to read more financial porn. We're talking brand new investors, OG. Brand new investors with Ellie Kay coming down to the basement here in just a second. You know, when you were a brand new investor, don't you find that you focused on a lot of the wrong stuff? I still focus on a lot of the wrong stuff when I start thinking about (laughs) investing. You got to go back to your training, don't you? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, well, Ellie Kay is America's family financial expert, author of The Little Book of Big Savings and also The 60-Minute Money Workout, among many other books. 14 in all. Of course, you've seen her on national TV, a commentator for Money Matters and Good Money on NBC News Now. She's a media veteran, top-level international conference speaker, Fortune 500 corporate consumer consultant. What has she not done, OG? She hasn't been on Stacky Benjamins yet. That's what she hasn't done. She's about to do that. (laughs) Bio-complete. Ellie's now finally made it that she's coming down to the basement. Let's say hello to Ellie Kay, talking to new investors and seasoned investors about starting off on the right foot. And Ellie Kay joins us in the basement. Welcome. Well, thank you. It's great to be here. It's about time we had a real pro in the basement, Ellie. (laughs) Well, thank you. You know, I got to tell you, Joe, it's a little bit cold down here. You think we could crank up that space heater a little bit? Well, you'll be proud, though. That's mom saving money, right? Shouldn't mom be saving money? Yeah, well, if she would give me one of her sweaters, I'd be a little bit more comfortable. I know. That's two of us. But she hoards those things. I want to ask you this. So I'm going to get to something a little later, which is we have this awesome picture on our show notes page of you in, well, what is it, an F-18 Strike Eagle? It's an F-15E Strike Eagle. F-15E. Oh, my God. My military friends are going to completely come (laughs) after me for that one. But I'm going to ask you about that later. But the first thing I want to ask you about is the first line in the 60-minute money workout, which is this. 60 minutes a week can completely revolutionize your finances, you say. And it's funny because people think that this has to be big and complicated. But for beginners out there, it really can be fun. Well, it can be. And, you know, it's all in the way that you approach it. One of the things my husband found was that we were arguing about money for like hours when we were first married. And then we came across the concept of, hey, why don't we set a timer? Why don't we just say we're only going to discuss this for an hour, one day a week, so that we don't continue ad nauseum with all these arguments. And so that's where it all started. And it really did work. It helped us get out of considerable amount of debt. 
helped us set up budgets. And then I began sharing it with other people and it worked for them as well. People ask about that, Ellie, about kind of the chicken and the egg. Should I start a budget first or should I have these family meetings first? It sounds like you're an advocate of communication first and the budget second. Well, yes. I mean, if you can't talk about the budget, what's the point of having a budget (laughs) if you can't get on the same page? And that's all communication is about finances. It's learning how to talk to each other. You know, I set up a lot of guidelines in the book and we can't throw food at each other. You can't ask, you know, say that they're stupid questions or be condescending. And we get all of that off the table, at least for one hour while we're discussing things. And it does make a huge difference. I wanted to have you on specifically to talk investing for beginners, because beginners are people that think a lot of the time that this is really difficult. In fact, I was talking to somebody just a couple of weeks ago who said, well, I haven't invested before. And then she starts talking about her 401k, Ellie. And I'm like, well, you already are investing. And she's like, really? Well, yeah. You know, it is amazing to me how people don't consider, you know, certain aspects of investing, investing. I mean, you know, buying a CD and starting a savings account, those are all forms of investment. The returns may not be as much as if you were investing in the market, but those are all good forms of investment. They're all necessary. The number one question I think I hear from people just starting out is I have all this debt and people are telling me to invest and I feel the clock ticking on investing, right? But I think I got to pay down this debt first. So which do I do, Ellie? Do I pay down the debt or do I start a portfolio? Well, the answer to that, Joe, is yes. (laughs) Correct. (laughs) Right. And so you are going to be doing both. You're going to be paying down your consumer debt. And at the same time, you're going to be taking advantage of key elements of investing. For example, the matching portion of the 401k, because that's money that's going to be going away that you can never recover. So if your employer offers that matching portion, then that's going to be a good move when it comes to where you're going to put your money. So you're doing both simultaneously. Yes, if you're diverting some of your funds towards investments, then you're not going to have as many funds going towards paying down your consumer debt. However, it's important to start with both because you can't regain lost time when it comes to investments. Are you a fan when it comes to paying down debt? Are you a fan of Dave Ramsey's snowball method or are there are other strategies you like better? Well, Dave Ramsey's snowball method was something that we used before there was a Dave Ramsey. So (laughs) it really is something that I've advocated for a number of years. So, you know, basically when you pay down one credit card, then you take the money that you were putting towards that credit card and you double up on the next credit card on the list. And then you triple up on the third one. And it's like a snowball. It starts to gain more and more momentum and you're paying down your debt that much more quickly And before you know it, you really can be debt free if you monitor how much you're spending so that you're not adding new debt onto existing debt. How much now today do apps play into a good financial game? I mean, you know, I used to do all this on paper, right? And now with all these apps helping me out, how much should people take advantage of technology to really get their act together? Well, I think it makes all the difference in the world. You know, there are fabulous apps out there, one that our family uses and our millennial children because- You know, we have young adult children now that have grown up with America's family financial expert as their mama. And so, you know, sometimes there's those that have gotten married, their spouses like it. And because they're marrying somebody that has no debt, no college debt, no consumer debt, no car debt. And so those mints are what helps people, whether you're single or married, stay on track and on target. You know, Mint is one of my favorites and everybody's heard of it. I'm sure, you know, you've talked about it a lot on your podcast, Joe, and it is a great way to be able to track who's spending what, where, and when. And then by doing that, you can also track your investments and a lot of other things. Another question I hear all the time, but I don't have money to invest. Well, shoot, Ellie, you hear that question all the time, right? I don't have money to invest. How do you get people to figure out where there's money to actually start putting away? Well, you know, I start to ask them some questions. I ask them how old their car is, because if they've got a car that's one or two years old, well, they've been investing money in a car every couple of years, every two to three years. And so maybe they could drive that car an extra year or two or even drive it after it's been paid off for a while. And that can free up a car payment. It can free up money to invest. And then you have some really great guests on your show that talk about ways to create some margin and space in your budget by paying less for practically everything that's part of your household budget. So when you pay less, then it frees up that income if you don't immediately spend it. 
like my husband, he was a born spender and he'd look at the checkbook and he'd say, and I was saving all this money at the grocery store, you know, 50% uh, with coupons and things like that. And he'd say, oh, wow, look, we have a lot of extra money. Let's go out to eat another time this week. So if you're not spending it again, you can create that margin and that funding, you know, you can create that out of your budget by spending less. And there's your money that you have to invest. You know, David Chilton, the wealthy barber guy, the Canadian author says that budgets are baloney. People do what they have to do and you save first. And then that kind of forces your hand when it comes to going to the grocery store, right? I have less money, so I spend less at the grocery store. Do you agree with that or where you hide money from yourself and then that creates less spending or less spending first and then, you know, save the rest? Well, You know, I love his approach and it works for him. But if I stood up in front of an audience like at the yellow ribbon programs for the military and I said, hey, by the way, budgets are baloney, (laughs) then that would probably be the last time that I ever stand up and give financial (laughs) literacy education. So I disagree on that aspect of it, but I do agree with the psychological aspect. You know, there is a behavioral financial attitudes that are out there that exist. And it's a way of psyching yourself into being able to get by on less. And I think that's basically what it comes down to. In his perspective, hey, people do what they have to do. If they have less, they spend less. Well, yes, that could be true. But I do believe in having a plan and just trying to stay to that plan because I think that's actually more effective. Well, and for brand new savers too, when you talk about the plan, does it make sense to hire somebody to help you with a plan like a financial advisor, or is it better to kind of get your feet wet first and kind of know where you're going on your own and then maybe hire an advisor down the road when it's more complicated? Well, Joe, for people that are just beginning to invest, there's so many things that they need to do first. So I don't think you should hire someone right away. I think you should look at the things we talk about You know, in the chapter that you're talking about in the 60-minute money workout, we talk about things that you have to do first. So you have to have paid off a lot of your consumer debt before you become too aggressive in investing. You need to build up a rainy day account so you have that in savings so that, you know, you'll have that when you need it. You need to begin to invest in 401ks that especially the up to the matching portion that your employer may offer. So these are all things you can do without a financial advisor in place. It's only later on when you're looking specifically as to what kind of funds that you want to invest in that you may want to hire an expert. And of course, you know, there are companies that may offer those services just as part of having accounts with them. For example, Joe, you and I met before we were together here in your mother's basement. We met at USAA in San Antonio. And they have advisors on staff that will give advice about how to invest, where to invest, what kinds of funds would be best for you, giving your financial goals, your age to retirement and all these other things. That's right. Fidelity has stuff similar. I think Schwab has some. Well, I've got accounts through Scott Trade and their brokers are calling me nonstop. Right. And I guess one of the main things I get concerned about is that when you have someone from a company that's advising you, just to be sure that they're really going to do what's best for you and what's not best for their commission scale or for the funds that they're really trying to build up and sell and so forth. I mean, even when it comes to kind of the old fashioned type of brick and mortar places, it used to be that insurance salespeople that would try to get you to buy a a whole life type of insurance policy because they got huge commissions on them. So it's just watching that part of it when it comes to the funds that are being charged to be able to incorporate some of that advice. You mentioned this earlier and I can't just get it off my mind. So I have to ask you, how much pressure do your kids feel having America's family financial expert (laughs) as their mama? Well, it is kind of funny. I think they just do it naturally. You know, I don't think that they really feel pressure. I think if anything, maybe their spouses feel pressure because their spouses weren't necessarily raised the same way my kids were. But it's really funny because, you know, in some cases when you come home and You tell your mom about a friend of yours in college that maybe has a prison record. I mean, to that would be something that would be, oh, no, I mean, they were actually, you know, have a criminal record. But in my kid's case, it's not something like that. They'll come home and say, Mom, you won't believe it, but Kristen has consumer debt. (laughs) She has credit card debt. Can you believe it? I mean, so it's really kind of funny. But they actually appreciate it. Now, one of my older sons works for JCPenney's and they're doing some cutbacks. So they just outsourced his entire department 
Oh, no. And he's, you know, out of a job. He's looking for another job. He's got a little bit of a severance package. But he came to me the other day and he says, Mama, thank you so much that because of you, we don't have student loan debt. All my peers at work are scared to death because they've got these four or $500 payments to make for their student loans in addition to everything else. And at least I don't have to worry about that. I was reading just recently, and I think we're going to have our roundtable tackle this on Friday, about a woman who's nearing 40 and just moved back in with her parents. Imagine that. I can't imagine that. So, I'm- What would you say if one of your kids came knocking on your door at 40 years old, Ellie, and said, I think I need to move back home? Oh, wow. You know, that's a loaded question. You know, what would your mom say? <laughs> she'd say, of course. Move into this basement right here, you and know? Then, yeah. Um, and then my mom would say, of course, and then she'd make it a living hell till I moved back out. <laughs> yeah, well, either that or, you know, she'd bake you fresh cookies and right. do your laundry and everything else for you. But with my kids, I don't see that ever happening. I do have military sons. And if, God forbid, there was some kind of extenuating circumstances that had anything to do with their health, of course, you know, they're always welcome for me to move into our house. So unless it's some dire straits type of things, I just don't see that happening to our children because all of them minimize the amount that they have in debt. They try to drive their cars for free and they also save money for a rainy day. So, you know, can't read the future, but hopefully that won't be in our future. Yeah. Put yourself in as nice a position as possible so that that's not a drain later on when they do the downsizing. Let's do this. This is the next big question I get, which is, okay, so I'm starting out. I've got all these options. In fact, I remember this. I remember thinking the first time I had a sum of money that I wanted to invest and all I can think about is opening up a newspaper back in the day, right? And I see billions and billions of options about what to do with my money. I can buy a stock. I can buy a mutual fund. Now I can buy exchange traded funds and there's all different annuities. I can buy all this stuff. What are some ideas to start with if I'm just beginning and I've got this long-term goal to just get a portfolio started? Well, Joe, I get the same questions you do. I have people that get inheritances. They have maybe $20,000. What should I do with this? And of course, I give the same advice you do. And that is first thing, if you get a windfall of some kind and it's burning a hole in your pocket, well, you pay off your consumer debt first. And then you fund your 401k with the matching portion. And then you fund a Roth IRA because that's another good place. And a spousal IRA, if you have a spouse, if you can do that. And then once all of that is done, then you can begin to look at other type of funds that you can contribute to. And of course, you know, I do like Roth anything when people are younger. And of course, you know, the next step too is that you're going to be looking for a discount broker of some kind because people that are just beginning to invest, they don't really understand about brokerage accounts where you have to pay for trades and you have to pay for the management of that fund. Which types of funds though would I use? Do I start off with like a basic S&P 500 fund or does it just depend on what your goal is? Well, it does depend on what your goals are, but I am pretty fond of the tortoise and the hare analogy. You know, I do like to kind of go slow and conservative. However, you know, my millennials right now that are in their twenties, they can afford to invest in some more aggressive funds. But When you do that and you're looking for aggressive returns, you could get a 30% return, but you could also get, you know, a 10% loss. So that's the nature of speculative funds in that you have more risk involved with it, which means you can have greater gains. But of course, it means you put yourself at risk for greater losses as well. So I think you hear people talking about a balanced portfolio. And I think depending on your age, depending on your goals, when it comes to retirement, that you have that balanced portfolio based on your age. And you can have a portion of your funds in investments that may have more risk associated with them. But then you also want S&P 500 funds that are going to be pretty steady with a pretty steady return, maybe even investing in CDs or ETFs that have a good return history and those kinds of things. And you may want to explain, Joe, because we are talking to beginning investors, what an ETF is. Yeah, that's a good one. I'm going to let you do it. Okay. So basically, to put it real simply, it's an exchange traded fund. And this is a way for you to be able to expose yourself to a certain area of investment without 
having to do it all yourself. For example, if you bought an ETF in real estate type of funds, then you don't have to go out and buy rental property and you're investing all your money in that, hoping for a return in your area, a recovery of the market so that you could maybe even flip a house and do things like that to be able to capitalize on the return of the real estate market. So you just buy an ETF that has exposure and investments in all kinds of real estate across the board. And you can buy ETFs for gold. You can do it for a wide variety of things where you have that exchange traded fund. Yeah, it makes it really, I don't know, simple and straightforward. Exchange traded funds get more complex every day. I feel like the industry is trying to make it more complex, but at its heart, it's very simple investing, isn't it? Well, it really is. And you have to watch that where we keep stressing the idea of a balanced portfolio. You don't want to have 80% of your investments in ETFs. So you have to have a really nice balance. And that piece of the pie, the division of your investments in your portfolio is going to look different for you, Joe, than it looks for me, going to look different for my Marine, than it looks for my Army son. It's going to look different for everybody based on their needs. So when Army and Marine sons get together, I bet that's a lot of fun. Well, yes. And then we throw in the Air Force son (laughs) uh, to make it really interesting. So we have... We have boys that graduated from Navy, graduated from the Air Force Academy, and then the baby's over at West Point still. And to say that we're a conflicted family is a gross (laughs) understatement. I wonder what you did like at the Army-Navy game, how that goes over. Well, you know, they all cheer for their own team, and I cheer for everybody. So I know I'm always cheering for a winner. That's good. Talk about diversification, Ellie. Well, yeah. You know, I mean, if they were here in your basement right now, your mom's basement, I mean, we wouldn't even be able to have this discussion because they would be talking about which team is better or which branch of the service is better. Come on. You've got to have a secret. I mean, I know they're all your kids and you love them equally, but you got to have a secret favorite of those three academies. Oh, well, I would never disclose that even if I did. (laughs) But nobody listens to the show. You know that, Ellie. Come on. Oh, come on. Well, here's the next question I get, which is a lot of people, young, aggressive, think, you know what, especially in this economy, instead of going to work for, quote, the man, I'm going to start a business. And if I'm looking at investing, isn't investing in myself or investing in a business a better place to go than investing in like, you know, you talk about like an ETF. You know, Joe, when I hear people talking like that, I want to see their business plan. I want to see what they have in mind. And if I say, well, hey, you know, can I take a look at your business plan? And they'll say, what's a business plan? Right, right. And if they say that, then I get really scared, you know, because you're kind of missing the forest for the trees type of thing. And The main thing about investing in a small business or your own business and launching it is doing all your due diligence. As a matter of fact, you know, in the 60 minute money workout, you know, we're talking about the investment workout right now, but I have a home based business workout that you do one that you do before you begin to set up your business to decide if I should do it, if I should quit my day job, if I should do it simultaneously with my other work just to keep cash flow going. You know, it helps you really decide how to do it initially. And then there's a second workout that can help you take your business to the next level. And as a matter of fact, Joe, I know that you say most people don't listen to the show that's never heard, (laughs) but if they will email me, I will send them a free copy of the 60 minute money workout specifically for home-based business. It's just a file. And if they mention that they heard it here on your podcast, I will send that to them for free. Awesome. You know what? I'm going to put a tag on that. We'll have people go to, let's have them go to stackingbenjamins.com forward slash Ellie, E-L-L-I-E. So stackingbenjamins.com forward slash Ellie, and that'll forward right to the page. How about that? That sounds great. Yeah, And then that's awesome. that Thank way you. they can request the file and we'll just give it to them because they were listening to Stacking Benjamins today. How about that? That's awesome. So you not only have, by the way, the 60-minute money workout, which I love, but there's, I believe, 14 books, Ellie? Right, 14 other books. So we have 15 books out there right now. One of my most popular books is Living Rich for Less. Right. Which is kind of is a, an overall type of financial book that hits a lot of different areas. But then my heart book, You know, if you say that you've got a favorite child or you've got a favorite book, I do actually have a favorite book and it's Heroes at Home. And it's a book that has reached a million military families. It's been revised three times and it is a book that helps military families, not only with their finances, but with every aspect of that military lifestyle. That's great. I love the little book of big savings. Right. You know, that's a great book to give to 
people that are graduating from college or even in college or just in their 20s living on their own. The Little Book of Big Savings, Joe, when we were talking earlier about creating margin and where do you find money to invest? Well, that little book can help you find ways to save money on absolutely everything you spend money on, and it can free up that money so that you can have investment funding to go into those funds. And these are available everywhere, right? Yes, they are. And they're available at my website as well, but they can get them anywhere. Excellent. We'll link to your website, lek.com. We'll also have copies of them in Big Ben's store here at stackingbenjamins.com. So, okay, we have this picture. Forget all this financial stuff, Ellie. I got to know about this. I have this picture of you sitting in a fighter jet, giving the big thumbs up. What the heck's going on here? Well, I love adventure, and this may surprise people, but I go skydiving. I go bungee jumping, hydrofoil racing, zip lining. I've never met a roller coaster that I didn't like. And so I just love adventures of all kind. And when I've been doing this work with the military for the last 20 years, I went to Seymour Johnson and I did a couple of really big programs for the entire base. The wing commander and I were talking and I said, you know, I've always tried to get a ride in a fighter. I tried to get on with, you know, I worked for ABC News in the past. And so I was trying to get my like Joan London incentive ride that they give to news reporters and I tried everything I could and I couldn't get on with the Blue Angels or with the Thunderbirds or anything else. And I wasn't even fishing for anything. And by the end of the tour, when I was going back to the airport, he says, if you'll come back next year, I've gotten clearance through a four-star general to be able to fly you in an F-15E Strike Eagle. So you can come back and repeat the program this time next year and I will fly you in that jet. So it was really sweet. No, but tell me, so you're getting strapped in. And obviously, if you like roller coasters, you're not that worried. You're excited. But how did it feel just taking off in that thing? Because I've watched them take off and, man, just the force. Oh, yeah. Well, you know what? It's a huge psychological gig. I had to convince myself, okay, I can do this. This is something I'm not going to be fearful about. I got all kinds of advice from everybody when it came to how to not get sick. Because from what I understand, when it comes to just plain vanilla civilians like me, nine out of 10 get sick on that flight that they go on. So one of the pilots said that if you're underneath the oxygen level, then you can kind of pull off your mask a little bit and just drink some water. And that'll kind of help. You can open up your flight suit arms and you can let the vents put air into your flight suit and get a little fresh air kind of going in there. The chaplain that gave me advice said, you're closer to God, so pray. (laughs) So, you know, I, I did that as well. So every time I started to feel nauseous or we would do something a little bit different, you know, an aileron roll, a low level 500 feet above Kitty Hawk. Now that was sweet. You know, flying over the ocean, we did approaches, touch and goes where it looks like we're gonna land, but then we just take right off again. And we pulled eight G's when we were doing all of these Holy things. And I was cow. in the I was in the seat for one point six hours. So thankfully by the time I landed, the big question was, did she get sick? And I did not get sick. And so it was funny that night, Joe, my husband, who's a fighter pilot, thirty year career fighter pilot, he looked at me so seriously and he said, Beloved, other than every day you gave birth, I've never been more proud of you than I was today. <laughs> Hey everybody, it's Joe's mom's neighbor Doug and I've been sitting in the corner in Joe's mom's groovy hanging papasan chair from the 70s just learning about investing. Although I'm not sure how much learning I'm doing because, well, I mean, have you heard the show? Anyway, at least Joe's mom shared this bag of Funyuns with me. Man, there's a lot of fun in these onions. Speaking of fun, how about some trivia? When was the first stock exchange open? I'll be right back with the answer after I find a cold, delicious, and preferably foamy beverage to go with my processed onion. Now that's just good eating. OG and I are excited to have two sponsors at Stacking Benjamins that we can send people to who will help any of our listeners get their financial house in order. First of all, let's solve your debt problems by sending you to stackingbenjamins.com forward slash SoFi. That's S-O-F-I. We talked to Dan Macklin about SoFi because they started in student loans, but then quickly moved on from there. We wondered exactly why they started with student loans. Student loans just seem to be a bigger issue for people. There's over a trillion dollars of student loan debt out there. 
And it was, it really is and, and continues to be a pretty inefficient market. Lots of people overpaying. But we've quickly moved on from that. So as well as student loans, we're now doing other things, including mortgages and personal loans. But student loans was just a, a great entry point because so many people were overpaying. So if you're someone who's overpaying for student loans or for other types of debt, whether it be mortgage or personal loans, head to stackingbenjamins.com forward slash SoFi. And once you've been there, we'll send you to stackingbenjamins.com forward slash magnify money. Because the thing about magnify money that I find really cool is that they do not ask for any personal information before showing you how different financial products rank against each other. And part of that rating system is just how little fine print there is. So we asked Nick Clement, CEO at Magnify Money, to explain more about their rating system and helping you avoid fine print. Oh, the fine print can get out of control. You'll always see marketing which tells you this is free or we're even going to put money in your pocket if you do business with us. But then when you look underneath the hood, you can find fees on top of fees on top of fees. And some, some of the worst are in the world of overdrafts where you can be charged $35 per item and then after five days of a negative balance charge, another $35, particularly in that area, you see banks that are worse than payday lenders, although they're not advertised that way. So for checking accounts, savings accounts, and debt products that you understand, head to stackingbenjamins.com forward slash magnify money. I'm back. Joe's mom's neighbor, Doug, here, and I found a drink. Back next to the boxed wine was a case of this thing called Jolt Cola. Ever heard of that? I mean, doing the math, I figured out I could pop two of these babies during my break, and holy cow, you think there's caffeine in these things? Anybody know what time it is? Why is my, why is my heart racing so much? Who's staring at me? Anyway, let's breathe and give you some trivia. The question was, when, when was the first stock exchange? And the answer... 1531. Wow. Belgium's first stock exchange was in Antwerp. Brokers and money lenders would meet there to deal in business, government, and even individual debt issues. They didn't have real stocks, though, and dealt entirely in promissory notes. Whatever those are. Anyway, isn't that awesome? I mean, 1531. Okay, I'd love to chat, but I think I should check out my blood pressure, don't you? See ya. All right, let's clean up this mess at the table. Hey, PK, what are you doing coming down the stairs, man? I'm looking for OG. Do you know where he went? Oh, he just had to go polish his shoes, man. What? So what's going on? How have you been? <laughs> Never see that guy anymore. I I've been doing great. Just got a brand new monitor. I wish I could drag it to the basement with me. Oh, you, you get uh, a big monitor? Like, the, did you get the, did. did you get 40 the, inches. Yeah, I was going to say the compensation monitor. You got that one. <laughs> That's what they call it, huh? I, I don't know. <laughs> I got no idea, but that's nice because now, you know, as you get older, I mean, I'm 47 years old, dude. When you get older, you can't see crap. So I need that huge monitor. That's how I figure I'm going to use four pixels where I used to need only one. So you've got this article on the internet from Elite Daily that is called, if you have savings in your 20s, you're doing something wrong. What's up with this thing? Maybe it was bait for you and I to talk about or something, because this this article just seemed to be written to be tackled on the show, don't you think? I did think so. If you have savings in your 20s, you're doing so. I thought the goal is to have savings. I thought so, too. But maybe this is if you want to have debt in your 20s. Or either way, it's completely wrong. Yeah. So the person that wrote this uh, article says that you shouldn't feel guilty about spending money on yourself in your life. I guess that's, is, 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 I don't know, is that the point that they're trying to make? Let's talk about this. What's this article about, PK? Because people haven't read it, obviously. Uh, well, first, I'll back up for a second. Um, the, the young author, Lauren Martin, she basically said that when one of her very successful friends was falling into a cab to go out uh, for a night on the town, he basically said, bet on yourself and don't bother saving any money. You know, from there, she expanded it into this whole discussion about whether or not you should even bother having savings in your 20s. Her main argument really was, well, you're going to make a lot more money when you're older, in your 30s, your 40s, or whatever the case may be. So that is uh, what Lauren's argument was. It's funny because they say that youth is wasted on the young, but I think that in this case, compounding interest is wasted on the young. <laughs> so her points here... When you're too worried about your bank statement, you're not making your own. 
I don't know why she completely paints it as a black and white thing. You know, everyone's on the internet checking their bank statements nowadays. Anyway, I don't know if, even know if I open the envelopes when they show up. It doesn't take that long to look at your bank statement and make sure, you know, it's at least positive. Yeah, it seems to me like people using apps today, I mean, you should you should worry about having some money in the bank, especially when you're in your 20s. If, if I could, and, and I've written about this before, I had so many problems with, with my banking and my financial planning when I was just out of college. I paid so much money PK in bank fees because I didn't have a handle on it. At the very least, if you know what your bank statement is, you'll avoid those fees. You know, all these new technologies might be wasted on the young, like Lauren, if they're just going to ignore them. But, you know, there's a lot more technology nowadays. It's easier to stay on top of these things without needing a degree in finance to know exactly how much money you have. She says next that when you're saving for yourself, you're refusing to bet on yourself. It's a silly argument altogether. I kind of dug into those numbers um, last year in a, in a series of articles. Where her argument is that you're going to make like $60,000 more dollars, um, if you go out to bars. That's not exactly her argument. You know, I'm kind of paraphrasing right. a little bit. They'll make a lot more money going out to bars and networking and, and earning a lot more money. When it, when it comes down to it, though, it's really only the, the elite workers, the, the top 10%, really, who are going to see a $60,000 difference from when they're, say, 29, 28 to the late 40s or so. It, it's not super common for someone to go from making, say, you know, 60000 to 120000 yeah, but with, and, and what you're saying isn't to not bet on yourself. I mean, people should definitely spend money on on an education. Yeah, you absolutely should. But, you know, there's also, you know, forks in the road. We talk about these things like uh, you should have some savings or investments at some point. You know? <laughs> um, just completely ignoring it. She made some comment basically that says that if you're paying attention to your 401k, your life is just K. Very funny, very pithy. But, you know, I got to make the argument that you got to invest early. I love this one. When you have something to bank on, you have nothing to reach for. She says, when you have nothing to lose, you have everything to gain. Isn't that amazing? <laughs> Maybe it's one of those motivational points like, oh, you'll work harder if, you know, there's a fire under you at all times. But, you know, obviously I disagree. I'd, I'd prefer to have a little bit of a life raft, even if it's in the form of stocks. I know we've discussed emergency funds in the, uh, in the past here, but, you know, it's nice to have something behind you. <laughs> When you live your life by numbers, you strip yourself of poetry. Isn't it? That, that's so bad. <laughs> oh, it's beautiful. It brought a tear to my eye, I think. Do you think this is just a justification for this writer of uh, just saying it's okay for her to be broke and to not pay attention to anything and, you know, and, and just yeah, personally, about, like, if, if I already had thought something like that and I was looking for someone to make my argument for me, I wouldn't take it from one of my friends falling into a cab or an Uber who just shouted out, bet on yourself. You know, it's like taking advice from people screaming out YOLO or something. <laughs> I bet you say YOLO all the time. Oh, I, this might be the first time in months. <laughs> when you die, you can't take your money with you. I do agree with that. <laughs> I mean, it's hard to disagree with that, right? <laughs> uh, it, Working for Uncle Sam. Yeah, but once again, that is that is the point, PK, is that is that all things in moderation, right? It's funny because... I remember having some clients sometimes that saved way too much money, but th that was a nice problem for people to have versus what she's advocating, mm -hmm. which is save nothing. I kind of like the the illustration or, or uh, when people compare money to tools, right? You could fill your garage and your workshop with tools, but every once in a while you got to, you got to work on a project, you got to build something too. You know, like as a 25 year old, you can assist your 60 year old self, but once you're 60, you can't go back and assist your even 26 year old self. It, time only moves in one direction, as far as I know, unless there's a time machine <laughs> hidden in the basement somewhere. And, you know, if you end up with more tools, if you end up with more money, that's a problem you want to have, right? Yeah. We'll link to this article in the show notes at stackingbenjamins.com. But, but what's your big overall point in this one, man? My big overall point, if I had to summarize it in one line, is ignore the headline, ignore the text in it. You got you to gotta have some savings in your 20s. You know, invest in stocks, save something in your 20s. Your 60-year-old self will thank you. It's amazing to continually read about both of our sponsors in the news, OG, about how great these two companies are. So we're very happy that they're on board with us. Speaking of on board, if you want to get on board with what's going on at Stacking Benjamins, head to stackingbenjamins.com forward slash stacker. And that's where you'll sign up for our email list, get all the behind the scenes stuff. Of course, big behind the scenes stuff has been at the green room. And you'll see that if you go to our Facebook page or our Twitter account, you'll see references to the green room. That's if you want even more Stacking Benjamin's goodness throughout the week. 
Sign up for the stacker to get it in writing once a week and then head to the green room if you want more audio than what you get just here on the three-day week Stacking Benjamin show. All right. We get letters, OG. Tug just brought down the mail. And man, do we have, and he was running fast, by the way. What's up with that? A little too much jolt. Do people know what jolt cola is? Mom's got this jolt back in the back of the basement. Do these youngsters know jolt? I've never had jolt. Yeah, no. but you've heard of jolt, haven't you? Maybe. No? One of those big time caffeine drinks. Back when they did that thing, remember Jolt was the first one, but they did those more and more and more caffeine and then somebody died, remember? Because they just stuffed this thing. Anyway, first letter today comes from Dan. Hi, Joe and OG. He's got a question he was hoping that we could help him with. We're always up for helping, aren't we? Yes, sir. Unless it's mom and the dishes, then we're out of there. He's currently in the process of applying for term life insurance. He's a wife and three kids. Wants to make sure they're provided for if anything were to happen to him. That's awfully nice of Dan. The catch in his case. Smart idea. He is an ex-smoker. Uh-oh. He quit in June of 2013, two years and four months ago. You know where this is going. <laughs> He's compared several providers and for various reasons outside the scope of this question, he chose Mutual of Omaha. Since he quit for two plus years, he qualifies for their preferred tier, but not their preferred plus tier. In order to qualify for that, he's going to have to be tobacco-free for three-plus years. So his question is this. Should he bite the bullet and pay the extra $20 a month it'll cost him and reapply eight months from now and replace the current policy? Or does he chance it and wait eight months? He's got a feeling he knows what the answer will be. He can almost already hear OG calling me a, quote, dumbass for even asking. I've never called anybody a dumbass. <laughs> he thinks chalking this up to the cost of his poor decision to smoke is the healthy way of looking at this. But does he have any other options or anything he should look out for navigating this process? Thanks for the letter, Dan. Oh, gee, what's going on here? How do I answer this? So here's what I would say. Let me answer it from a different perspective. Near as I can tell, when insurance companies test do medical exams for insurance, they take a look at your uh, blood work. They do height and weight, depending on the amount of insurance. They may ask for doctor's records. You know, if you're buying lots of insurance, they just want to make sure that you're fine. They may do, a, you know, a cardio test of some kind. They do non-stress tests. They do all different levels of testing. So, of course, one of those tests is for narcotics. They test you for smoking. I presume that's just a regular blood test or a urine test. So if it's a blood test or a urine test for smoking... Let's say, for example, you have to understand how long that stuff stays in your system. So the likelihood of the insurance company, let's say, well, I shouldn't say this. How about if we know that that it only stays in your system for 30 days or 90 days or 180 days? I don't know. I don't know that they know the difference when they test whether it's been two years, seven months and 12 days or three years one month and 14 days. By the same token, you also have to know how the insurance company works if you die in the next two years. And Correct. If, if you pass away. So, so that's what they call the contestable period, right? So this is if you get insurance under false pretenses, right? So you buy a million dollars of life insurance and it costs you $100 a month and then you die of lung cancer because you were a heavy smoker. And they say, but you said you quit smoking. And they find out that you quit two years and seven months and 14 days ago, not three years, one month and 11 days ago, they in all likelihood will adjust the benefit that they pay based on the premium that you have been paying, assuming that you'd fall into the classification that you would have told the truth, if that makes sense. Right, right. So I don't see a really profound difference between two and a half years and three years in my mind. You might also look at other companies that maybe have two-year requirements. If you're not set on Mutual of Omaha or whatever you just said. Dan and I actually talked about this, you know, between because we're a little backlogged. Because you guys already have the answer and you're just testing to see what I would say based on what you say. <laughs> I forget about this all the time. Like, oh, yeah, he, I've already told him what to do. This is just your opinion. on. What no, we're doing. sharing it with the whole it. audience. We're sharing it's it with everybody. Done. He's already made his decision. So there's actually no value in this conversation whatsoever. Maybe not for Dan, but for everybody else. But let me tell you this, because most people don't understand how insurance works and how the underwriting process works. That's valuable info, OG. But I'll tell you the other side is that 
it's funny when you check with Mutual of Omaha, because I said I would apply for it now. I would never, ever put your family without insurance Correct. to wait for a time to go. So I would, no matter what, I would do it now. But then the second thing is, is that I would ask ahead of time while I'm in the process, what the cost is, is to get that top tier and what the difference is going to be in my premium if I get that top tier. So he did those things. But what's funny was they were going to charge him a bunch of money to redo the testing to get the top tier. However, if a few months from now he went back and just canceled this policy and reapplied for a new one, of course, they can't charge people for the testing that don't yet have a policy. Those charges would go away if he just applied for a new policy. So then it became the cost of the retesting and keeping the same policy versus the difference in cost if he cancels the policy and just goes through the crap again in a few months. And that's what he decided to do would be just take the policy now and then be retested later on, but use that new testing to qualify for a new policy. So that's the way that he went, but there's a little bit of math involved, but it's not hard. You know, it's going to be a little pain in the butt if he does it, but you know, cost of smoking, like Dan says, right? Yeah. I mean, ultimately if maybe that's the other side of it too, is that he was talking about $20. I mean, is really $200 a year going to make or break. I mean, in some cases it does make or break the budget. Probably not. Next I mean, you're spending more than not smoking. So next question comes from Steve and Steve wanted to make sure he said hi to everybody. He said, hi, Joe, OG, Kathleen, round table. Might as well said, Doug, cat. Uh, he didn't though. Let's he, make a note that he did he, specifically not say it to Doug. He did not. And that was on purpose. I'm sure Steve, Steve says he loves listening to the show. Thinks we put out a great podcast. Thanks, Steve. He especially loves the new format and loves the fact that each Week has a theme, and the roundtable discusses that theme at the end of the week. On to his question. With the recent volatility in the stock market and everyone on the show talking about staying the course, he was wondering if we could talk about how to know if your financial plan is or isn't working. So is it the market not working or your financial plan not working and how to go about changing the plan if it isn't working? Some background about him. He uses a variety of low-cost index funds to allocate his portfolio. Currently, he has a pretty aggressive overall asset allocation, about 80% equities, 20% fixed income and cash. It's mostly because over half of his savings for retirement. However, he's also included saving for a house and a wedding into his overall portfolio. That's probably going to be needed in the next two to five years. Like everybody else in the past couple of months, he's seen his investments lose value. In that time, he's felt a little bit like he needed to put on the brakes, but instead applied the gas and purchased more assets according to his plan. He thinks some of that nervousness is to be expected, but how does he know if it's time to reconsider his asset allocation? Furthermore, he doesn't know how to go about reallocating. So good question there from Steve. So when's the plan not working, OG? Well, first of all, okay, so a portfolio is not a plan. So all we just heard from him was, here's my portfolio. Does it work? And we got a little planning in there. Like, I'm going to retire someday. And in sometime in the next two to five years, I might use some money for this other stuff. That's not a plan either. That's just some chicken scratching on a piece of notebook paper. The plan is I will retire when I'm 60 years old with $100,000 a year of income in today's dollars. And to get there, I need to contribute X dollars per month. And I have this amount of money in the account right now, and it needs to grow at this rate of return. So that's a plan. And if you are building your plan from the position of, here's what the goal is, here's how much I'm contributing, here's how much I need to have, and then solving for what sort of interest rate you need to have the money grow at. Because there are times, Joe, I'm sure you remember this, when you were an advisor, you'd do a plan for a client and say, well, you only need to grow your money at 6% to meet your goal, or you need to grow your money at 9% to meet your goal. That is going to dictate how the portfolio is put together. So if you need a portfolio that's going to grow at 9%, it better be full of stuff that can grow about at 9% a year. If your portfolio needs to grow at 6% to reach your goal, then you fill your portfolio with stuff that grows historically at 6%. So that would be my answer to that. And it sounds kind of like a non-answer answer, answer, I suppose. But if your portfolio is servicing your plan, which is to say, I need to reach this sort of rate of return, and these types of investments make that rate of return historically, and I'm diversified, then you don't do anything. You just keep putting money into the plan, rebalance once a year, and that's that. Great question from Steve. If you've got a question for us, 
Send those to Joe at stackybenjamins.com. Coming up in the next couple of weeks, by the way, we're going to have two episodes, which are all letters. So hopefully OG will be completely, completely caught up. Should be a couple of great episodes. Love doing I those. do not believe that for a second. I don't believe it either. I believe we'll have an all letters episode. I do not believe that we'll be caught up. <laughs> hey, and if you're somebody that not only wants to be caught up, but also wants to have a great 2016, our partner Kathleen has put together an awesome Awesome organizer for 2016 called The Remarkable Year. Make 2016 incredibly remarkable. Head to stackingbenjamins.com forward slash remarkable for that. Also, our friend Chloe, hey, Chloe, has been asking about the live courses. Next week, we will tell you when the dates are for the live courses. OG and I on site. And if you've got time to spend a couple days with us, we will guide you through stacking 101 Benjamins again here coming up in January. But we'll have those dates in stone for you next week. Chloe was asking about that OG. Other people have asked about that in the last few weeks, and it's time we did that again. It was fun last time. That's actually the most fun I have doing is, you know, like kind of doing that presenting stuff. Yeah, great. Answering questions, that sort of thing. Great time. So expect more on that next week. Also, last promotional thing here if you're wondering if we beat farnoosh remember today is the last day to help shelby schreiber our rider in the texas 4000 man we've had a great month and thanks to everybody who's decided to help us out and doesn't it feel good just to give back around american thanksgiving time whether you're in the u.s or not just a great time to give back as a stacking benjamins family head to stackingbenjamins.com forward slash texas 4000 texas and the number 4000 to help out shelby on her ride to build cancer awareness shelby riding 4500 miles her dad passed away of cancer when she was in high school and he said he wanted her to run a marathon And instead, she said, you know what? Instead of running a marathon that supports cancer research, she's going to ride from Austin, Texas to Anchorage, Alaska on her bicycle. How about that? And all the money she raises, by the way, none of it's going for her ride. All the money that she raises going to help out this charity, Texas 4000. StackingBenjamins.com forward slash Texas 4000. And also, as a side note, you know, maybe we can beat the evil Farnoosh Tarabi. Evil Farnoosh Tarabi. I love saying that because there's nobody less evil than Farnoosh Tarabi. But anyway... Farnoosh, we're coming to get you here on the last day. That's it, OG. And it's funny because... Here on our last segment of the show, what should we have learned today? I think the overarching thing we should have learned, whether we're a new investor or an old investor, it makes a lot of sense. You know, you go to Steve's question, which really your answer ended up being about planning, not about portfolio. Dan's question, really, you know, and what we didn't tackle was how much life insurance to buy. I think Dan already had that piece down, but that comes down to your plan. Ellie K talking about what to focus on if you're a beginning investor and how to find money when you don't think you have it all comes down to the plan kind of drives everything and what you do on one end of your plan is definitely going to affect the other side of your plan i think if there's any overarching theme today that was it this is something that we could talk about every single day all day and people will still forget this everything you do has to serve your plan your plan dictates the decision making that you use for everything And it could be something as simple, we kind of joked at the beginning about getting the Lexus for Christmas. There's nothing wrong with having a Lexus or even giving one away for Christmas. That would be a fantastic, probably makes you feel pretty good to gift that sort of thing. If you've got enough money to be gifting cars to people, that'd be fantastic. And I wouldn't mind receiving a Lexus for Christmas. That would be okay on that end too. Send that to OG at stackingbenjamins.com. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) Gift certificate for a free Lexus or something. But my point is, is that that's a fine thing to do if it's in the context of your overall lifetime financial plan. You know, the question about how do I invest my money? Well, when do you need it by? I don't know, maybe sometime, someday. Well, that's not a plan. A plan is I'm going to retire on this day with this kind of money. So the more specific you get about your plan, the more specific you can be about the things that you need to do and put in there to make the plan happen. Yeah, fantastic. You know, it's funny because we always talk about, and this is an analogy that I think a lot of people have heard before, but it's so apropos, which is, You know, looking at the tree, a lot of people grasp at the leaves where you really need to grasp at the root, right? 
and think about whenever you're thinking about your financial plan, is this really the root of the problem? Am I getting at the root of the problem or am I just going to get a few leaves when it comes to the problem? Big thing. And a great time of year right now, by the way. I've actually never heard that analogy ever in my entire life. You never have, really? No. Yeah. I thought you were going to do the forest and the trees. Oh, I like that analogy, too. You know, people looking at one tree instead of the whole forest. Yeah. But the root, you know, we talk about getting to the root of the problem. I get the symbolism. <laughs> I didn't say I didn't understand it. I just said I'd never heard it. Yeah, it's pretty cool, especially this time of year, isn't like it? Like if there's a root and it's like the deepness <laughs> of the problem. Is what you're trying to, like, because there's roots. And if and there's nutrients see, coming see the into tree. the tree. Yeah, you see the tree, but there's, like, stuff <laughs> below the tree that really supports the tree. And that's the stuff you don't see. So you'd have to, like, dig up all the stuff, go really, really, really deep into the ground. Yeah, I got it. We're off on a complete non sequitur now. But, you know, I love that line from, what's it called, The Art of Business or The Art of Something. I don't remember. It's a popular book where they talk about so, fear. You know, well, yeah, this is just another analogy about trees, which I like. People say, you know, when's the fear going to go away as we grow this podcast or as we do different things, as I try to get better at my job or whatever it is that I'm doing, when does the fear go away? And the author of this book said, you know, as the tree gets bigger, it just casts a bigger and bigger shadow. The fear is never going to go away. You just got to get used to it. Another tree analogy that I really like, just as long as I was thinking of the StubHub tree. Where, like the commercial from StubHub, where you could go up to the ticket tree and get tickets. Oh, how great is that? That would be cool. That's my favorite analogy. It'd be like a money tree, but not money. It would be tickets to your sporting events. Speaking of the money tree, do your kids get the concept of electronic payments and electronic money yet? Yeah, they really haven't experienced it. Yeah. I mean, how do you kind of explain that to them? It's so tough to explain that kind of thing to kids now. Because I remember even my kids, back when they were your kid's age, saying... I'm like, no, we can't afford that. Well, Dad, you got that plastic card in your wallet. <laughs> Just take out that plastic card. Because well, I know it's that's probably true. because I never say no to my kids. Maybe that's that. <laughs> Dad, can I play Halo? No, actually, sure. I don't care. Sure. You're six can years I have a old. Cupcake for breakfast? <laughs> yeah, I don't know. Do you think that would be a good choice? I would like to have a cupcake for breakfast. Okay. Damn. Because your kids know a lot about nutrition at this age, right? I like cupcakes for breakfast. So who am I to judge? I can't do the do as I say, not as I do, as I'm like shoveling cupcakes in my face at 7.45 in the morning. Oh, man. That'll go good with my hot chocolate Milky Way. Uh, Yummy. What are we talking about again? I don't know. We got way far away from planning, didn't we? Now we're on cupcakes and kids. We're in the shadows (laughs) of the roots of the tree. Well, let's get back because the root of this podcast is in good money habits. And you know what? On Wednesday, we're going to talk to Ethan Block, who is the founder of the Red Hot Red Hot OG app digit talking about saving money. He wrote this article that one of our readers, Michael, sent to us about saving and millennials. And you know how everybody gives this advice, like don't have a credit card, do some of these things that sound really good. Ethan challenges each of those. And he says, you know what? That's the 101 advice. Let me give you the 201, which it was refreshing to read some of his advice. So I asked him to come down to the basement and describe it. He's going to be doing that on cool. Wednesday, kind of bending financial advice for people that aren't necessarily beginners. Today was beginners. Wednesday is non-beginners. See you then. Stack and Benjamins. This show is the property of the Free Financial Advisor, LLC. Copyright 2015. This show was edited by Joe Salcihai and Isabella Bianca. Special thanks to Ellie K. You can find more from Ellie at http colon forward slash forward slash www dot L-E-K, that's spelled E-L-L-I-E-K-A-Y dot com forward slash. Joe, wouldn't it have been easier if we just said L-E-K dot com? I think they get it. Special thanks to PK for showing me the Jolt Cola and for today's appearance. You'll find PK at dqydj.net or now that he's had his Jolt, running laps in the backyard. You're still here? It's over. Go home. Go, go.
It's time for holiday movies. Is it already? Don't you think so? I got to tell coming, you. coming, but it doesn't feel like holiday season yet. Cheryl did not know about the silly Hallmark channel until we went for Christmas time to my parents' house last year. And my parents keep the Hallmark channel on nonstop. And every single movie is the exact same premise. A woman or a man who had either a loved one or a spouse who died or they're kind of in a bad place. And then this other person comes along who is the perfect person, but they don't recognize it right away. And during the holidays, the holidays help them see that this person really is the right person for them and they live happily ever after. And it's one after another. And I got to tell you, I thought you were going to say that the Hallmark Channel has on like National Lampoon's Christmas Vacation, followed by Home Alone 1, 2, and 3. Why can't we do that? Well, Home Alone 1, maybe 2, 3. I didn't say they were good. I'm just saying that they're holiday-esque. No, no, no. These are made for TV. Ah, holiday bullcrap. Holiday, yeah. Yeah, overly cheesy things. And my wife loves that stuff. My wife was laying in bed the other day, and she's like, I just don't feel very good. I feel kind of sick. And I said, well, it's because you've been watching Sex in the City all day. That would make anybody sick. It'd make me just zing. Bam. Physically horrible. Yeah. But holiday movies that you do like, I thought I'd bring this up. I mean, Christmas Vacation is still, when I've watched that movie, maybe what, 26, 27 times? And I still I watched laugh. it 26 times last year. I know. And I still and laugh. there's still like every so often you'll hear like a one liner that you miss the whole time, you know, like when he's talking to Eddie and he's getting like, it's like a moose cub. He's like, drive you out in the woods, leave you for dead. <laughs> I love that one. I love the other one where they're getting ready to go sledding. And he says to Eddie, Eddie's like, oh, no, I can't go down the sledding. See, I got this metal plate in my head. And if something happens, you know, we wouldn't want it. And Chevy Chase just turns him and goes, you think it'll really matter, Eddie? <laughs> How about at the beginning when he's like shaking the hands of his boss as all the cronies are walking by? And he's like, kiss my ass, kiss my ass, <laughs> kiss his ass. You know, what's funny is that I don't know if you've seen that stuff about Chevy Chase recently, but I've been watching Community and, you know, he ended up off the show and it was kind of mutual. He would not stop like walking off the set and he was hard to work with and just he's got this horrible reputation as being just a rotten person to work with. And it's funny because I watch those older movies of his and he's so funny, but I can still see like if his humor is anything like he is in reality. You know, what a jerk. <laughs> I was going to say, being around that guy for any length of time, you'd be like, man, what a horrible person. All right. Time to watch holiday uh, or Christmas vacation again today. That'll be on the agenda. Yeah, what about Elf? Elf? Yeah. Oh, Elf. Yeah. <laughs> I'm ashamed to admit that the thing that I just thought of in my head was Elf. <laughs> I think you got to be. <laughs> you know, the like, the, yes. the card. <laughs> I was like, Elf? He had nothing to do with Christmas. <laughs> You never watched the Elf Christmas special? Wouldn't that have been bad? Oh, my god! Like a geeky friend of mine was reminding me the other day that ABC actually had, right after, you know, when Star Wars was really hot in the late 70s, they had a Star Wars Christmas episode. And I think they try hard to completely get rid of this thing, like make sure that nobody ever sees it again. But it was a Star Wars Christmas. It's on the internet somewhere. <laughs> it's got it. Like, really a Star Wars Christmas episode. Elf is a great movie. In fact, I saw a thing on Facebook the other day that was like quotes from Elf that you can use year-round. Speaking of sugar, remember the whole sugar scene? You're talking about cupcakes at the end of the episode. He's got sugar on top of sugar. That's fun to say. Yeah. About free gum, about how he found free gum. How about when he buys his dad lingerie and says for someone special? It's like that (laughs) see-through deal we have. Buddy the Elf, what's your favorite color? How much oh. of that was, like, on demand? You know what I mean? Like, how much of that was scripted, and how much of it was just Will Ferrell being funny? That's the best scene of all, though, when he's just taking that children's book author and, oh, look at him. Yeah. <laughs> Does Santa know that you're away from the workshop? If you crack <laughs> one more joke. Yeah. Did you have to take a reindeer to get down here? That's awesome. And, you know, people that listened to the show last year, I love some of the really old ones. You know, Christmas in Connecticut, I think is fantastic. Some of those really, really old black and white shows. Uh, Of course, White Christmas is amazing. Could watch that every year. It's about a tribe of asparagus children, but they're self-conscious because (laughs) of the way the pea smells. 
That's like buried That's in there. Great elf right line. I forgot yeah. that line. Yeah. yeah.